She would not interfere with our being raised in the Catholic Church. She suffered that indignity. And on top of that, they wouldn't marry them in the church. They had to go to the rectory. They don't still do that. But she suffered that and put up with it. And all the years we were growing up, when we came, each one of us, as we came home from first grade, we told her that she was going to hell because she wasn't Catholic. The nuns told us that. And we believed it. And then my dad had to sit down with us, you know, and straighten that out. But we t came home and told my mother that. And she was a Lutheran, very godly person, praying mother. And... Uh, she became a tongue-talking holy roller like the rest of us did. It was awesome. I mean, she won. My brother and sister, the whole, we all came in to the Assembly of God, and she went right along with that, and she was so happy with that. And the last time she was in the Catholic Church was at my dad's funeral. And he was in, too. But uh, anyway, she suffered that indignity and became a mom. Moms suffer a lot of things, you know, when you're a teenager, you, can be, you get a little bit rebellious and insolent and insulting. And she put up with that, not happily, but she won. <laughs> In the end, she won. She was... A master, this is a, this is a, a writer wrote this, not me. Well, uh, my mother, a master of guilt trips, showed me a photo of herself waiting by a phone that never rings. <laughs> Mom, I call all the time, I said. If you had a voicemail, you'd know. So then after that, my brother, this writer, says installed it for her, the voicemail. Then I called her the next time I got her message. If you're a salesperson, press one. <laughs> if you're a friend, press two. If you're my daughter who never calls, press 911 because the shock will probably give me a heart attack. <laughs> um, a police recruit asked, what would you do if you had to arrest your mother? And he said, call for backup. <laughs> So on Mother's Day, I think of some of the mothers in the Bible. You think about Eve. Can you imagine how grieved she was when one of her sons murdered the other son? Can you imagine how grieving that was? One of her little baby boys killed his brother. Of course, they were grown men then. But to a mother's heart, they were still her boys. Think about Noah's wife. We don't even know what her name was, but she came, became the second mother of all mankind. Think about Sarah. She was so desperate to have a family that, she, that, a family that suggested that Abraham father a child with her servant Hagar the Egyptian. Abraham fathered Ishmael through Hagar. And when, they, when he was about 13 years old, Sarah became pregnant in her old age. Isaac was born, and there's been trouble between the descendants of those two brothers ever since. You think about Lot's wife, who didn't trust God enough to obey and not look back at Sodom. I think about Naomi. Her husband and both of her sons died in a foreign Land, and she became destitute and childless. You think about Naomi's daughter, Ruth, who would not leave her mother. And it wasn't her, it was her mother-in-law, but she wouldn't leave her. And Ruth married Boaz, a wealthy landowner, and became the grandmother of King David. Think of Hannah, who was grieved because she was childless. When God did, did bless her with a son, Samuel, and she gave him, that is to say, she dedicated him to serve at the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Now think about this. Hannah gave her son that she was so desperate for 
But she promised, Lord, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him. I will give him to serve in at Shiloh. And that wasn't anywhere near where they lived. But she only saw him once a year. Once he was weaned, she took him down and presented him to Eli, the priest who was ministering at in in that uh, temple or that at that town. And I don't know how far it was from Ramah where they lived to Shiloh. I wasn't able to determine that, but it must have been a considerable trip because they only went there once a year. So she only saw this little boy once a year. And every year as they went down there, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 24 to 28. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull. This boy was probably three or four years old at the time. An ephah of flour and a skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Can you imagine? Hannah was desperate for this child. And out of her gratitude, she gave him to serve the Lord at Shiloh. And she would only see him one time a year. Who would do that? Very few would do that. God blessed her. And she had more sons, three more sons and two daughters, actually. The boy's name was Samuel. He was the last and most powerful of Israel's judges. He would be the one to anoint both Saul and David as kings of Israel. Kings were even were afraid of him when he came around. He was a powerful man. But she gave him into the service of God because she said she would. The Israelites' villages were built by the settlers of Canaan. They were on hilltops. They were quite small, possibly 400 people. In the largest of these, which was Shiloh or Gibeon, for instance, these towns were mostly unwalled, though they were part of a larger political unit or regional chiefdom that provided security, the Israelite villages within a given region were subjects of the major town of the area, some of which were like Shechem, were very large and controlled considerable territory. But the Israelites lived in nuclear households during this time, and uh, judges often with their relatives in clusters of houses around a common courtyard. The houses were made of mud brick with a stone foundation and perhaps a second story of wood. The living space of the houses consisted of three or four rooms, often with sleeping space on the roof or in a covered roof loft. One of the first floor rooms was probably a courtyard for domestic animals, mostly sheep and goats. At the time of the biblical judges, the hills were densely overgrown, covered with a thick scrub of pine, oak, and terebinth trees. And it was often too rocky for the sheep, so raising animals never uh, stood at the forefront of the economy. Instead, the early Israelite settlers of Canaan would burn off some of the brush, terrace the hillsides within an hour's walk of the village and plant grain, primarily wheat. They also grew lentils, garbanzo beans, barley, and millet. They had orchards on these terraces as well. Olives, they grew. They grew. So Hannah's everyday life would have consisted of sharing the household duties with Penina. Penina was her rival wife. She probably helped with Penina's children. 
cooking, cleaning, fetching water, marketing, etc. People worked hard in those days, cooking stew, baking bread, harvesting grain. We know that Hannah could sew because every year she would go down and make a new uh, robe or clothing for um, Samuel because he would grow out of the clothes. So what was life like for Hannah? She was married to Elkanah, who had another wife, Penina. And the other wife had children, and Hannah did not. Penina teased, mocked, and tormented Hannah. In those days, married women had babies and raised children. That was life. For a woman not to be able to have children was considered shameful. She was thought of as being barren, a word that we think of as referring to a landscape where nothing will grow. This torment went on for years with the other wife te teasing and tormenting her. The only bright spot for her was that Elkanah, her husband, loved her dearly. We don't know which one of those wives came first. It seems that Hannah lived in constant torment. She had to live in the same household as her tormentor. She was constantly confronted with the children of her rival. That was in her face all the time. She was desperate to be a mother. She was completely unable to do anything about it. Every year, Hannah, or Elkanah, both wives and the children would travel to Shiloh to make their annual sacrifice to the Lord. At that time, the Ark of the Covenant and the Tent of Meeting were in Shiloh. Eli was the priest in charge. On one of those trips, we're going to read it from 1 Samuel chapter 1, 3 to 17, year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of, of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? But if a woman wants to be a mother, that's a powerful desire in her. That's a powerful desire, and it was as it was here with Hannah. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace. 
And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. So they went back home. And the Bible says in the course of time, she became pregnant and gave to a birth of a, to a son, Samuel. Happy Mother's Day, Hannah. In the course of time. We don't know how long that was. Sometimes we have to wait for God to bless us. It's his, when it's his business. He's sovereign. We don't know how long that was. But it happened when God decided it was going to happen. What a happy reversal. Her fortune is completely reversed. No more shame, no more torment. She would be a mom at last. Hannah's prayer of praise and gratitude, 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 11. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my, ho my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. Of course, she knew who her enemy was that she was talking about. Penina. Remember when Hannah prayed for a child, she prayed in silence. Her lips were moving, but no sound. Eli noticed and thought she was drunk. Now, however, Hannah is praying out loud. <laughs> the enemy that she is talking about is Elkanah's other wife, who would provoke her because she had no children. It could be that Penina's children were her tormentors also, because they would mimic what their mother was doing. There was... There is no one holy like the Lord, verse 2. There was no one besides you. There was no rock like our God. This is pure praise. She had been desperate to become a mother. Only God could bring an end to her desperation. And now that he has done it, she returns praise to God. She's honoring him aloud and before other worshipers. Verse 3. Do not keep talking so profoundly or let your mouth speak such arrogance for the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. Who is it that was talking so proudly? Her tormentor, the other wife who had several children, the tormentor's, the tormentor's deeds are weighed and the tormented one is finally vanquished. Verse 4, the, bow, the bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. At the hand of God, reversal of fortunes comes. You've experienced that. Reversal of fortune comes at God's hand. The biggest, baddest, meanest become the weakest. The weakest, hopeless, helpless become strong and victorious at God's hand. Only God can bring about such reversal. Hannah has been on both sides. The agony and the ecstasy. She has been hopeless and now she's the vindicated one. Verse 6 of her prayer. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. Hannah recognizes that all life and death are in God's hands. From the moment of conception to the last breath, God is sovereign in every life. Verse 7. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. Verse 8, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Picture Job in the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. That's Hannah's prayer of praise to God. Picture the rise and humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. Picture the rise of David from a boy shepherd to a warrior king. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
Picture Solomon, who begins his reign hiding in the baggage, rises in splendor, and then descends into idolatry. Verse 9, it continues, He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Verse 10, those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalts the horn of his anointed. That is a prophecy in the prayer of Hannah. She counts herself self as one of the faithful servants. We only have a tiny glimpse of Hannah's life. But both times she goes to God. She goes in desperation and she praises in her victory. She counts herself as one of the faithful servants. We only have just a glimpse, just a glimpse. But did she go to God in her times of torment and despair for years? Yeah, most likely. God was her refuge and her strength during all the years of her torment. No one on earth could help her. Sooner or later, we all experience trials, difficulties, and despair. Such is life. We live in a fallen world. We live in a cursed world. The question is, does it bring us to God? Verse 11, then Elkanah went home to Ramah. But the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. In her prayer of gratitude, Hannah doesn't cite health and beauty of the boy. She overlooks the gift and praises the giver. God himself has enabled her to triumph. She gives him all the glory. There is none beside you in verse 3. No rock like our God. So can we like Hannah praise God for his holiness, his single uniqueness, his dependability, his justice, his sovereignty, his awesomeness. When we get together and praise God, those are the things we're praying for. We're praising him just for who he is, just for who he is. He's so amazing, so awesome, so enormous, so powerful, and yet he blessed Hannah. And that he blessed each one of us. And we come to salvation. That's the most amazing healing from the sickness of sin that we can experience. And he sends the Holy Spirit with conviction right to you. And that's why we praise him. With Hannah, we join with Hannah, praising God. We join with her. She's, mothers lead us. They lead the way. And she led. She had other kids. And you better believe she led those other kids and explained to them how awesome God is. How awesome God is. Well, God is awesome because he blesses. Mothershood is amazing. Motherhood. There, is, there isn't anything a mother will do, including kill or be killed, for the well-being of her children. Mothers will go around in frumpy clothes so her kids can be well-dressed. They'll go around in ragged shoes so their kids can have good shoes. They'll eat the morsels that are left over that, because all the kids will be filled first. Mothers do that. It's amazing how they sacrifice for their children. But if you mess with her kid, she's coming at you with claws and teeth. She's coming after you. Yeah, they come. They go for the throat. Maybe just verbally, but they, they go, they, they come after you. That's mothers. I'm going to ask the mothers all to come down here. We're going to pray over our mothers. And then they can all take a flower, a plant home. 
So come on down if you're a mom. Come on down. Some of these moms are grandmothers too. Most of them, I think, because <laughs> we have an older congregation. So come on down. And if you, if you need to sit, there's a couple empty seats over here. And uh, so come on down. Shirley's coming. And then all the mothers that we have in the house will be here. I don't know. If, I don't know if Shirley heard me. She, is she just coming into the? Is she coming? Yes. She can sit. You know, if she wants to. She's coming. She's a coming. Yeah. Well, she's moving along with that thing. You can sit if you want to. Huh? All right. Walk those wheels down. <laughs> well, we appreciate mothers, not just on Mother's Day, but every day. We all have mothers that we, that we love. Sometimes it's past tense because they're gone, you know, going on to be what's there to their reward. But I remember one time it used to be my job to make announcements and stuff, and I took the microphone, I was going around, and there was a lady in the back that was soon going to be a mother and I said to the people I said you've heard of a tsunami this is a soon mommy <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway Father God we come before you ask your blessings on all these mothers we thank you for the miracle of motherhood and what you placed in their hearts which cannot be found anywhere else Lord a mother's love is so unique and so different but it comes from the heart of God it comes from God through mothers and we're, we're just so amazed how you do things Lord but we ask not only on this Mother's Day but every day for you to bless every one of these mothers and the ones that maybe aren't here because they couldn't be here today we just ask you to bless every one of them we ask you to heal them where healing is needed bless them where blessing is needed we ask you to open doors where open doors are needed. And we just ask, Lord, that in your wonderful, holy way, for you to touch each one of them. Because you know right where they are, right what they need, right what their challenges are. And we ask you to just touch and bless and move and work in each mother's life here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>